ESB, proud sponsors of About the House. In this episode, I'll be following a brave couple who've taken on a very big project indeed. Most people would have walked in the other direction. I've come to Donegal to see a very special project. A brave couple have taken on perhaps the most ambitious project I've seen yet on About the House. Sean Debney and Emily Baisley have bought a plot of land on which sits a traditional settlement of stone buildings called a Clochon. They're planning to bring this ancient clustered settlement back to life for their family, one building at a time. We're here for the first phase of this project, the restoration of the biggest cottage on the site. Sean, Emily and their four children, Poppy, Daisy, Rowan and Myrtle, are planning a completely self-sufficient lifestyle that will necessitate very little interference from the outside world. More than anything, Sean and Emily want to make sure that no one will destroy this piece of Ireland's heritage. When we first came here, interestingly, where we're standing now, these two cottages here, there was planning permission to level these, take all the trees down, level the site completely and build a bungalow here. But we wanted to make sure that that could never happen here because it's so beautiful. This is something new for About the House, where we're restoring old ruins of vernacular cottages and transforming them back into a habitable home for a family. This is going to be a very exciting project. Buildings like this are a seriously big challenge. The list of unique problems they come with is very long. No foundations, extremely low ceilings, the difficulty of insulating walls due to the smallness of the rooms, not to mention the fact that you need to use specialist, which means expensive, materials in the restoration to ensure that they don't end up damp and full of mould. John, tell us about this clock on. What was it like when you came here first? Um, pretty much not far how you see it now, really. It's been derelict over 40 years now. It had two-thirds of its roof. There was two sycamore trees growing in the living room. It was probably knee-high in sheep poo and old bedsteads and bits of roof. And we bought it back, I think, virtually from the brink, another few years, and it probably would have been almost impossible to save without taking it from the ground up. I know you're both very committed now to ecological things mm -hmm. and keeping things, you know, very much close to nature. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we try, it's a struggle, I think. It's a struggle to try and do that. We're trying our best to do it. But this place allows that, I think. You know, the history of rural areas in Donegal really is self-sustainability and living within the means of the land. I wanted to find out more about the people working on the project. And what sort of trades have you got here working for you? What sort of people have you helping here locally? Pat Harkin, um, he's our stonemason, and he's really wearing his underpants on the outside of his trousers. He's such a star. Hi, Pat. And this staircase here, this looks really nice. They were a bit unsafe, so we totally dismantled them and rebuilt them. And what stone is it? The majority of the, the stairs were built out of granite. So what sort of mortar are you using? Um, this is put back with the a lime mortar, it's the same type of mortar that was used originally. Well, it's breathable, it's going to stop the damp. If you use it at ordinary cement, you'd have serious damp problems. How about the render here on the walls? It's a, a lime render as well. Beautifully done, and you're following this kind of undulating with the natural feeling of the yeah, wall. Yeah, yeah. Basically what we want is, is for it to look like uh, it was 100 years ago. And is it harder to do old traditional skills like this? It is harder, but uh, it's more of a love of the thing than, yeah. than a job. But what about the inside of the house? We're using every inch of space because there's six of us and um, it's not a huge house but it's, it's going to be big enough for all of us. We've, we've very effectively used all the roof space. We've built mezzanines in for bedrooms. We've got cosy little 
sleeping lofts for, for children. We've managed to fit everything we need in. We even have a guest room in there. Sean took me on a walk round their site. The stone structures of Emily and Sean's clock on are spread out over five and a half acres of land and are nestled into the contours. There are four main buildings as well as the additional outhouses of the main house that they're renovating. Sean took me inside the house to show me how things were shaping up in there. So what's this room? This is going to be the living room. What's this going to be up here? This will be um, our bedroom right. um, and then gives a third bedroom space for us. Yeah. OK, and what's in this here? This will be the, the little one's bedroom, Rona Myrtle's bedroom in here. Sean told me they were putting 20 millimetres of a hemp line material as plaster on the walls, as it's breathable and also apparently has thermal properties. However, I had some worries that this wouldn't insulate their walls well enough. It still won't be a well insulated wall. No. Any, um, any solutions to that at all? I think you know, we're not trying to get to passive standards here. So 20 mil is, is something towards that. Any more than that, we start losing some of the space in the room. And um, so it's a compromise. But fortunately, Sean had insulated the loft space well, and the house itself is small and compact. So even with the uninsulated stone walls, the family should, hopefully, be quite snug. Uh, this is going to be the kitchen. Right. And was it always down at this lower level? Um, we've dropped it a bit. It's always been on a, on a slope down from that top room. So you've lowered this floor now further down? Yeah, the idea is to get sort of seven and a half, seven foot eight really for the kitchen. It was too, it was too low. But I noticed down here... Yes, we've, we've reached, hit the sort of the right bottom, the base here. The base here. Right. Amazing, no foundations None at on all, the old no. wall. Yeah. But it's a very rocky granite site here, right. so it's very stable. Yeah. So it's like having one massive foundation. Outside, Sean has laid a trench for a French drain that will ensure groundwater is directed away from the house to prevent damp. However, Sean is sensibly making sure he is tackling potential rising damp from the inside too. So what we're trying to do is create a breathable floor system here. And the structure of this really is a layer of terram, a layer of loose fill uh, expanded clay aggregate, and then another layer of terram, and then lime and a mixture of, of expanded clay aggregates to form this subfloor that you see now. What is this terram? It's a, it's a fibrous membrane that allows uh, a sort of the, the moisture to permeate through and, and to breathe out. The whole point of having a breathable floor in an old house is to allow any moisture to naturally um, effuse out of that and into the atmosphere within the house. Although I do have a few worries regarding the performance of the walls, Sean and Emily are obviously taking great care to restore this building sympathetically, using materials and traditional techniques that are compatible with it. Sean had told me there was no main sewage here, so I was curious to find out how they were going to deal with their wastewater. But we, we wanted to sort of look at a different, more ecological, uh, sustainable way of doing that. So we've, we have a, um, a compost separating system just dealing with the waste from the WC. And uh, so that comes into a chamber where the, the liquid is separated from the solid, the solid is composted, and the liquid goes out to a constructed wetland that we built here. It's four ponds that we've created with a, a clay liner so that the water is, is separate from the groundwater. And then on top of that, we've put back some of the soil that we've dug out from underneath. And in the soil, we've planted 300 plus willows, water forget-me-not, water buttercup. There's all sorts of things that you'd find looking around this area anyway in wet land. And we've transplanted them and bought them and concentrated them to this area so that they can help to filter out the botanicals that we don't want going into the water system, because obviously we've got the stream and we've got the river. So we have to make sure that the water's clear coming out of the bottom. I believe it's like a little oasis there with all sorts of of wildflowers growing there and Absolutely everything. Absolutely beautiful, it really is. It's very funny because, you know, it's not very often you can say to somebody, come and see our sewage system, it's beautiful. <laughs> and it really is, it's a, a haven for bees and butterflies and frogs and water boatmen and there's such a diversity of wildlife already and we're not even actually using it yet. One of the things that I really like about this project is where Sean and Emily have consciously decided to restore the existing cottage rather than to extend it. And it's really given new life to this wonderful piece of legacy. But Sean and Emily have decided to manage this project themselves. And as so often happens, they've had problems with their schedule and budget. When do you expect to move in? 
well hopefully uh, by Halloween so I look forward to coming up We've here had several finished dates <laughs> the first one was two years ago Christmas past you know sort of so yeah we've been quite optimistic in terms of our moving dates over time but this is pretty realistic now I think what's the main driver to make sure you do get in on time well the big driver is we have to get on time because we're paying rent as well as near enough of a full mortgage now so it's it's more than tight you know it's we just can't afford to keep doing that for very much longer with four children a full mortgage and rent finishing on schedule really is important for Sean and Emily I just hope they do it after the break I'll be back for my second visit to Donegal to see if everything is running smoothly ESB, proud sponsors of About the House. ESB, proud sponsors of About the House. I'm back in Donegal to visit Sean Debony and Emily Baisley to see how their extremely unique project is going. They've bought a clustered settlement of ancient stone buildings and are embarking on a lifetime project of bringing it back to life one stage at a time. Sean and Emily are planning an alternative lifestyle that will involve them living off the land. Emily already does this with her work. She's an artist and uses only things from nature in her pieces. I went to her makeshift studio in their rented accommodation to see her creating some of her art. Living in our new house is, is going to be fantastic for my fairy pictures and fairy furniture. We have an absolute endless supply of materials there. Craft stuff has been handed down through my family for generations, really. It's something I've always, always been interested in. Um, always gathered things from nature. I call it going macro. You go out for a walk and all of a sudden I find myself going up close to to things and seeds and twigs and leaves and all sorts of stuff that normally you just pass by. Sean and Emily have four children and are currently paying for a full mortgage and the cost of their rental home. The pressure is really on for them to get this ambitious project finished on time. I wonder how it's going. After a quick look around the house to see what had changed, I was into the important business of finding out about progress. Well, Emily, Sean showed me around the house and lots of work still to do. Yeah, there's still plenty to do, yeah. What's the next big job? Um, the plastering. Once the plastering's done, we can then put the other floors down and start the second fix. You've lots of complicated staircases in there, yes. haven't you? And they're all really being yeah. hand on too. Yes. yes, they're having to be built on site in situ um, because it's not the sort of place you can go away and build something in a, in a workshop and then bring it in and expect it to fit because nothing's straight. You're using Irish oak, I believe, aren't you? We're using a mixture of woods, um, Irish oak and uh, Irish ash. It's so authentic with an old cottage like this, isn't it? Yes, yeah, and it's beautiful wood as well. Mm. There's some beautiful colours in the grains and hopefully we can leave most of it exposed and just treat it with a natural oil rather than paint mm. it. The Irish oak Sean and Emily are using started life as acorns, which were planted in Ballantemple Nursery in County Carlow. There they were nurtured to saplings and uprooted and replanted in a forest in County Tipperary. Once the oaks had reached maturity, they were cut down and brought into a sawmill where they were sawn into planks and air dried. The final stage of the process takes place in Dundrum Sawmill in County Tipperary. There the wood is kiln dried, tested for moisture content and lasers are used in the cutting not only to ensure uniformity but to guarantee that the best cuts of the wood are given to the end user. With this done, they're ready for Sean and Emily's joiner, Paddy, to turn them into the beautiful steps that will become a feature of their house. I came back to find out about the specialist joinery work that was going on. So the whole structure now of this, the carcass of this, is all, what, fixing off the new post, is it? Yeah, we've used a 4x4 four four post here to stabilise it, and we're using a, a cheaper wood here for the carcass. And then you're structurally supporting it there with yeah, the Yeah, we have another it? piece here. That yeah, stabilises it. That stabilises okay. the whole lot, and we've uh, left a nice storage space underneath. This is another example of the handmade customised stairs being made in this house and there's three more stairs to be made. 
the plastering may have started, but there's still lots of work to be done. I came to talk to Marcus McCabe about the specific type of plaster that was being used in the house. So what are the benefits now of hemp lime? OK, well, it keeps the atmosphere in the building dry, it reflects in infrared and it lets the building breathe. They're the key points of insulating plasters. I wanted to know what is in this product apart from slaked lime. Hemp, which is a fibre crop, and that helps to bind the mass together and strengthen the lime. And we also add some, some, some recycled glass powder as well. Most building materials are actually pumping CO2 into the atmosphere. Here's a building material that's actually removing it from the atmosphere. And the fact that all these materials are Irish made means their environmental footprint is very small. I wanted to find out why it's so important to use breathable materials in a traditional house. It's just the same as our skin. Everybody knows if they put on a plastic coat in the summertime, they immediately start to feel very uncomfortable. Sweaty. Absolutely sweaty. A house is exactly the same. It, it's absolutely imperative that the walls breathe. Marcus and his men had only just begun plastering the house internally, and they had a big job ahead of them. With so much still to do, I'm not sure whether Emily and Sean are going to make it into their house in time, but they seem pretty confident. It's going to be quite tight now to meet your deadline, isn't it? Do yeah, end of, it? end of October, we're still holding out for... Halloween um, party up here. Yeah. <laughs> You've got six weeks to go. Donny Gold six weeks. Donny Gold six weeks. <laughs> Look forward to that. But the next time I'm up, you're going to be living in here? Yes, yep, absolutely. Definitely. All right. Definitely. Is that a deal? That's a yes. deal. Great. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, you can see the amount of intricate handcrafted work that goes on in the restoration of a project like this. Now, they've said six weeks, but we've heard that many times before. Really, are they going to make it? That's the question. On my way back, I came to meet Duncan McLaren, a conservation architect. He had helped Emily and Sean get their clock on listed on the record of protected structures, which meant that they had secured funding from the Heritage Council to help them with their project. So they've decided now to consolidate back into one house. Was that a good idea? I think so. I think by consolidating into one house, they're actually they're making much better use or much greater use of the original buildings that are actually built on the site. Do you think they're doing it in a respectful way to the conservation and to the heritage? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're working very closely with the buildings themselves. As part of his work, Duncan had been conducting surveys into Clochons more generally, and I wanted to know more about his findings. So what is a Clochon? It's a group of houses associated with farming. In the past, people obviously relied on one another to survive, and people lived closely within sheltered parts of the landscape. How long do these go back? What's the earliest of these? They're referred to as uh, post-medieval settlements, but I think they, they may well go back further than that. Are all of these old clock-ons now typically protected structures? Uh, the majority aren't. Um, very few, in fact. Because so many of our heritage buildings, vernacular buildings like this, have not had protected structures, have we lost a lot of them? Um, we have, yes. Um, a lot through neglect. They embody, you know, there's a lot there that reflects the way that people lived in the past, which is obviously of interest. Um, but there's, there's an awful lot in terms of just the, the quality of the buildings and the, the craft skill that have been brought to building these buildings. If it's ignored and, and allowed to disappear, then, then it's gone forever. So it's incredibly important that people like Sean and Emily, who want to keep this fast disappearing part of our heritage alive, are allowed continued access to funding to assist them. I was back in Donegal for my final visit, and I was delighted to see that the scaffolding was down. It looked like Emily and Sean might just have proved me wrong. But when I went inside, it was a different story. Whilst the house had moved along, many of the intricate staircases were finished and the flooring was down. The Halloween party that they'd hoped to have had obviously not become a reality. You're a bit over time at the moment, I think, Sean, aren't you? You expect to be in by now? Well, a combination of a few delays and rampant optimism last time we met, <laughs> I think. A combination of the two of that. We had a bit of a delay on the hemp line plaster getting on site. And then 
when by the time that had gone on the walls, um, the weather had changed. It got very damp outside, so it had taken longer to dry out than we thought. And so we had to wait for that to dry off a bit before we could start some of the woodwork that Paddy's been doing, such as the stairs. So you know, we are about sort of four weeks behind schedule since last time we saw you. Are you a bit frustrated with the delay at the moment? I think when we saw the, the Halloween moving in date evaporate, there was a, a week of depression that followed. Um, but since then, I think we've done very well at letting go of having a final moving in date. We will be in, and it will be soon, but we're not going to put a date on it anymore. <laughs> but there had been one big development towards making their house a home. The wood-burning stove in their living room had arrived. Damien Nee, the man fitting it, talked to me more about the benefits of stoves as opposed to open fires. Damien, all of our houses would have open fires, and in fact, most of our rooms would have had open fires. Mm. How inefficient is that form of heating? All the studies suggest now that open fires are at best 10% efficient. If you light a big fire, it's sucking large amounts of heat out of the room. If there's no fire there and you're only lighting it two or three times a week, during the time it's not lit, it's siphoning whatever heat you've got up the chimney. So the difference between an open fire and, say, a stove, typical stove, what sort of difference in performance? Any type of a stove at all will tend to be 40% or more. Then the optimum stoves will be up to 80, 81% efficient. So how efficient is this particular stove? Well, this is a phenomenal stove, really. It's over 80% efficient, and ultimately, it's the air control that matters. It is the, the quality and the continuance and the consistency of air supply that determines how well a stove works. But whatever kind of fire you have, it's important to remember to have a carbon monoxide detector and a smoke or heat alarm. This stove is just the beginning of the final stages of turning Emily and Sean's house into a cosy home for them and their family. I wondered if it had all been worth it for them. Would you do it all again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it has been, it is worthwhile, it has been worthwhile, but it's been one hell of a journey and we weren't prepared for it. You know, we, we've never done any building before and to take on something as derelict as this was really quite naive, I think, you know. <laughs> but I don't think either of us regret it at all. No. The house is amazing. It's, it, it's even more special than building from scratch because we're breathing life into a, a very old building that has had life in it before, and it really is feeling like it's coming alive again. So are you all looking forward to moving in soon? Yes. Very yes. Much. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And are you getting impatient? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, I'll be following a family who are trying to create an energy efficient home that will be wheelchair accessible for their son. If you're interested in being featured in the next series of About the House, particularly if you've been creative with the space you have, please fill in an application form on our website. Proud sponsors of About the House.